as you will see. Watch this. Many times in life, we encounter immovable objects, which can bring seasons of darkness and gloom and even periods of depression. It can be a family member with a strong will who will not listen to sound reasoning. In this situation, it can be a son or a daughter who has decided to venture down a path which you know is not wise. You do all you can, but it changes nothing. It could be a person who has come into your life who is just straight up set against you, and there seems to be nothing that will change their attitude towards you. It can be a financial obstacle. You have needs, and you never seem to gather what is needed to get everything finished that needs to be finished. It can be a health obstacle that has come into your life and has turned your life upside down. It can be something where you live or where you work. The point I want you to see is that life has many obstacles, and some of them appear to be immovable in our lives. Watch this. Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews in the Persian Empire also faced some rather challenging obstacles that looked to be immovable. In our study tonight, I want us to see that with God, all things are possible. So I want to give you some encouragement. As we've been looking at and coming through the book, we've seen a lot of encouragement. And there are a lot of things. And, and I've had to, in my own life, coming through this book, God's allowed me and taken me down a, a path where I've had to exercise faith in exactly what I taught. And that often happens in, in a pastor's life, that, that God allows you to experience what you teach. And, uh, you know, that's difficult. I told you before, it's easy to teach it. Sometimes it's extremely difficult to live it. So we're going to look at three obstacles tonight. Some of them are obvious, but we'll put, we'll put them into a spotlight so that you understand how it fits with your life. The first obstacle, the obstacle of the king's heart. Watch chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, on that day, that was the day that, that Haman was hanged. On that day, the king of Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman, the Jews enemy unto Esther, the queen and Mordecai came before the king for Esther had told what he was unto her. Okay. Back to your paper. Let me show you something. The last time we were together, we looked at, we looked at this verse and how the king gave the riches of Haman over to Esther, but we did not talk about how amazing this was. This, this is the same king who had the six-month banquet to cater to his own ego. Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Watch the verses. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When, watch this, he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom in the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even 104 score days. So I show you that because I want you to understand that this guy's very proud. He's very proud. Watch, let me go on here. This is the same king that had Vashti removed because she embarrassed him in front of all of his guests. Esther chapter 1, 10 through 12 says this. On the seventh day, when the, king, when the heart of the king was married with wine, he commanded Mamumen, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, uh, Bagatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. So he eliminated her because she embarrassed him. Watch this. This man is very powerful. With the wave of his hand, he could have a person executed. He was the man who promoted Haman and gave, him his, gave his ring to him. He basically said, you write the laws, I will sign them. Now, all, of, uh, all at once, this man changes his mind. All at once, his heart is softened to the consistency of soft butter. Now it's completely different. He's, it's like he's a different individual now. And that's the work of God in his life. 
God is doing that because, uh, as I told you before, throughout the book, the events that unfold are for the glory of God. And that's what it's all about. And so the king, whenever he turns here and, and, he, and he gives the, all the riches of Haman over to Queen Esther, that's unheard of. Normally, when somebody that was connected to the king would die, all the riches would go to the king's estate. It wouldn't be handed over to anybody. And so this is extremely unusual what happens. Watch one through four. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman, the Agite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Back to your paper. Watch this. When he sees the tears of Esther, his heart is filled with compassion for her. Here's what I want you to see. No matter how hard a person's heart is, God can soften it. No matter how powerful the man is, he is no match for the mighty power of God. Proverbs 21, 1 and 2 say this, the king's heart, we've read these before, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Watch the words of Betsy Ten Boom. Watch what she says here. There is no pit, I quote, there is no pit so deep, but that he is not deeper still, unquote. We can extend the words of Betsy and say, there's no heart so stubborn that God cannot soften it. There is no man so mighty that God cannot bring him down. And keep that in mind. Because sometimes we look at people, we look at individuals that are in our lives, and we see those individuals in their hearts as unmovable because their hearts are so hard and they're so stubborn. Watch the application. This means God can change the most stubborn heart in a wayward son or daughter, and he can do it overnight. There's not one person who has their heart set against you that God cannot soften and turn their heart. There's not one hard-hearted, stubborn spouse, I could say anywhere in the world, whom God cannot change. God can bring the most mighty people to their knees if he desires to. Keep that in mind. That's exactly what happens here. He brings the most powerful man in the world at this time. Ahasuerus, the king, over all these provinces. I told you, he's a, he is a type of the Antichrist. And so he, he's, he's a very proud individual over this kingdom, throws a banquet to, to boost his own ego. And here's a guy now that is... His heart is just soft and as pliable as can be because God has softened his heart. Through the tears of Esther, through the requests of Esther, God has softened and melted the guy's heart. Let me show you what God can do. Daniel 4, chapter 4, 28 through 33. Speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, this all came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of, of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's heart, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour, don't miss that, 
The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Here's a guy, this was the, the again, the most powerful man in the world, and, and he is the proudest man in the world also, and he looks around at his kingdom, and he, and he says, this is my kingdom that I built with the might of my power, and basically he's saying this, there's nothing that can take me down, and God said, yes, there is, and in the same hour, in the same hour, he went from being the most powerful man in the world to feeding in the field and eating grass like an oxen. Watch the next line. If God can change the heart of Ahasuerus and the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, then he can certainly change anyone's heart that we must deal with. A wayward son, a wayward daughter, a stubborn spouse, a hard-hearted boss, a difficult companion at work, somebody that just gets dead set against you for some reason that is you don't even understand. All of those hearts can be changed. And I give you that to encourage you that this came through the, this was no doubt there was prayer there. It's not mentioned, but it, we're, we're told of the fasting. And so fasting and prayer always go together. And so no doubt it came through the prayers of God's people. And so if you have somebody in your heart, in your life, and their heart is like a stone, it seems like to you, it's got a bitterness in it. It's hard. It's, it's like nothing penetrates. And, and they got a, they got a, you know, did you ever get around somebody that's just got that, that one track mind and it doesn't matter what you say, you cannot change their mind. It's like, the truth could walk down the middle of the road and hit them between the eyes and they still wouldn't recognize it. And you think there's, there's no hope for this situation. And I say to you, yes, there is. Yes, there is. If God can change the heart of Ahasuerus and melt it down like he did, and if God can change the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, and, and I could add this, if God could change the heart of my dad, and if you would have known my dad before he got saved, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. A man that was so proud that just provided for himself for everything, needed nobody to do anything for him whatsoever. And I always thought in my life that my dad's heart was like a stone, and I thought that surely God's not and can't penetrate that. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that, but... It took one statement from me that God used to pierce my dad's heart and soften it. And I watched that happen in just a little bit of time one evening and turn everything around to where my dad came to know Christ as Savior. I say that because I know that every one of us have somebody in our lives that's got a heart that's hard and won't listen, is stubborn and set and just sometimes you want to just sit back and scream because you can't get them to see and understand the truth or maybe the direction that they're going. So it drives you crazy. I give you encouragement by this obstacle that was in the way. This was this, you know, it, if we were to back up into chapter four, that's what Esther said this is the obstacle. The king's the obstacle. If I'm not invited and I go in, I could lose my life. It was a major obstacle. There's another one here. Number two, watch this one. The obstacle of the death decree. Okay, so, so watch this. Not only was there the obstacle of the king's heart that needed to be dealt with, but also the obstacle of the Persian law. That's a, this is another thing, okay? It's one thing, you got the king's heart, the, God softens the king's heart, but now the Jews are still under a cloud, Watch this. In Daniel 6, we get valuable insight as to why this was an obstacle. And we went over this before. This is a review, but it's good for us to be reminded. Daniel 6, verse 8, verse 12, verse 15. Speaking of the law of the Medes and the Persians, O king, establish a decree and the, the sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. 
Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which all earth not. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statue which the king established may be changed. And that's the same thing right here in the book of Esther. You can't change it. The king's heart had been changed, but the death decree was another challenge. What are you going to do about that? Because we know this, okay, once, uh, remember whenever Vashti was moved and, and, and uh, the order was given to have her removed, that could not be reversed. And so I'm sure in the mind of the Jews, that's ringing loud. This is a Persian law. You can't change it. Watch what happens, 5 through 14, watch it. I'll read verse 4. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleased the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seemed right before the king, and I'd be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written, watch this, to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which were in the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman and him that hath hanged upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you. In, in, in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Savan in the three and 20th day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded under the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces which are from India, even unto, or India unto Ethiopia, 120 and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by posts on horseback and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city, to gather themselves together. Let me go back and read that because you missed that. Watch that verse again. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people and the Jews should be that the Jews should be ready against the day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the post that rode upon the mules and camels went out and being hastened, pressed on by the king's commandment and the decree was given at Sushan, the palace. Amazing. Amazing. Watch what I have here. This is amazing. The decree could not be reversed. So the king allowed Mordecai to write up another decree in which the Jews were permitted to defend themselves on the 13th day of the 12th month. But they were not just permitted to defend themselves, but also to kill their attackers and even take their belongings. They were they could spoil them. Watch this. The king provided his scribes and stamped the document with his ring, making it official. The announcement was then distributed throughout the kingdom. The new decree did not cancel out the previous decree because you couldn't do that, but it did place the Jews on level playing ground with the Persians. Things like this just did not happen. The king gave permission. Watch this. I want you to consider this. He gave permission to counter a law that had earlier been established and stamped with his ring. And then he gave permission to a foreign people to kill his own people in self-defense. You know how many they're going to kill? Anybody have any idea? 
about 75,000 Persians. That's a lot of people. King gives a permission for him to be able to do that. We'll get that on Sunday night, maybe, if we get that far. Watch this. We can clearly see the hand of God to, to, uh, on this counter decree. No king would sign this against his own people, but this king did. You see that? You see how God can turn a situation around? Uh, nobody, uh, I'll say this, uh, if you would have lived then, if you would have been, if you and I would have been Jews there, and, and we're living underneath this, you, you and I couldn't, have, if, if they'd have said, here's a pen, write an unusual script, how are you going to escape this? He would have never thought to write that. Because what kind of king is going to give permission to, a, to aliens in his land to be able to kill his own people if they attack him? None. Unless that king's heart is moved by God. Watch the application. Looking at what happened here in Esther should remind us that with God all things are possible. It should also remind us that our God is greater than anything that we face in this life. God has his will, and it will be carried out. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, we talked about this before. Paul wrote, in, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That's a good verse to remember for the day and age in which we live in. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So God's working everything, everything for the counsel of his own will, everything, that's what it says, all things. Our responsibility is to live so that we glorify him. To the praise, watch this, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Watch what is recorded in Daniel 4.35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, did you get that? He doeth according to his will. Let me skip that next part and say this. Among the inhabitants of the earth, he's going to do what he's going to do. It doesn't take away, it does not take away our free will. Don't, don't confuse that. He's not, this verse is not saying that we are puppets, as some people teach. That's not the case. But what he does, he allows man to exercise his sinful desires at times and his free will and God arranges the events so that they will glorify him let me go back to Daniel 435 again and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou next line whatever stands in front of us is nothing against our Lord what are you facing let me ask you that Boy, I tell you, you talk about something that speaks to the, to the teacher tonight. I, I, I just say this, what are you facing? God's greater than that. God's greater than that. Psalm 91, 1 through 6, so many verses to consider connected with this. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. For thou shalt not be afraid of, of for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Watch this one. This is really good. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday two obstacles dealt with the king's heart that was a tough one the 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 persian decree irreversible they didn't change it they just wrote up another law that said the jews would be on level playing ground and they could what they could do it gave them plenty of time they could gather together and whenever they were attacked they could fight back and not only could they fight back they could kill their attackers and they could take their spoil they could take everything that belonged to them there was one more obstacle and that's a difficult obstacle in our lives the obstacle of gloom the obstacle of gloom you say it is that an obstacle? Well, let me ask you this. 
You ever been in a situation where you've just been under that cloud? You've just been under that cloud, and it's like it's there all the time. You can't get away from it. It's, it's forever. Even if you have a good day in the back of your mind, there is something that you sense all the time that is not right. You've been under that gloom. You've been under that despair. That becomes an obstacle. You want to get beyond that. Watch what happens here. From the time the death decree was issued, the Jews were living under gloom. The joy had been stolen from their lives. Every morning they got up, there was a reminder that they were one day closer to execution day. When they went to bed, the fear was there. When they woke up in the night, the fear stood over them, waiting to attach itself to their daily lives. The gloom was impossible to escape, but the gloom was about to lift. Watch 15 through 17, finishing out chapter 8. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in a royal apparel of blue and white. These are royal colors. And with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Sushan rejoiced and was glad. Let, let me just stop for a moment and say something here. He's now the prime minister. He's taken Haman's place. He's the prime minister. Why do I got to know that he comes out in blue and white and a crown of gold? And I, I don't have any of this on your paper. This is just a thought that I didn't have room for, because if I'd have put it on your paper, I'd have went beyond six pages, so I'll just tell it to you out of my mind. Okay, so he's got, a, he's got a garment of fine linen and purple, and why do I need to know that? Why do I need to know that? Why do I need to know that's how he went out? And, and I think the message is this, that when God blesses us, this has nothing to do with pride. This has nothing to do with pride. But when God blesses us and God does something, we need to live in such a way that others can see that so that they can see our hope and ask of the hope that lies within us. You understand? That's, and, and, and you're going to see here in a moment, that's exactly what happened from this. Exactly. I think this is a picture of how, because of how we have been blessed, we are now royalty. We are, listen, we are higher than prime ministers. We are children of God, priests and kings with him. You understand that? We're, we're above Mordecai's position. So should, not we not, should we not live in such a way that people see that, that joy within us because of what God has done and, and, and what he's blessed us with as believers? Watch verse 16. Let me get verse 15 again. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the Lord, or from the presence of the king in a royal apparel, blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city Sushan rejoiced and was glad. Boy, they seen him. They're thrilled. Here's our new prime minister, and he's one of us. Verse 16. The Jews, watch what happens. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. I'll come back to that. In a moment, verse 17. Now here's, watch this one. And, 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 and in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And watch this, many of the people of the land, that be Gentiles, became Jews. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Watch your paper. I got to shoot through this. From the time the death decree was issued, the Jews, I already read that, I'm underneath here. Sorry, I'll get all wound up here and get the wrong verses. Verse 16 is a very revealing verse. When a death decree was countered, the Jews then had light and gladness and joy and honor. Before, they were living in a gloomy darkness with no joy or gladness. They're under a death sentence. They're under a death sentence. Watch verse 17 again. Give you that one one more time. And in every province, every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Back to your paper. When the joy of the Jews was made manifest, many of the Gentiles became Jews because the fear of the Jews fell upon them. This means the Gentiles would come alongside the Jews and accept Judaism. Ruth helps us to see what this would entail. Ruth chapter 1, 14 through 17. Watch this. As her and Naomi are coming back from Moab, 
And they lifted up their voice. And this is after Naomi said to Ruth and her sister, Orpah, go back to your own people. Go back. Okay. And they, they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Okay, here's what it means to become a Jew. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Whether, where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but, but death part thee and me. Back to your paper. One day the Jews were facing gloom, and the next day they were rejoicing. The darkness had lifted, and manifestation of the hand of their God on their lives was obvious. I give you that to show you how quick things can turn around. Watch the conclusion. The obstacles of gloom and despair are very difficult to live with. But we live in a fallen world, and therefore sadness, darkness, and sorrow are the results of sin in our world. Let us keep in mind, when these times come, they have come to pass and not to stay. Did you get that? When we go into those seasons, they have come to pass and not to stay. Psalm 30, verse 5b says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And another one that I love that Jeremiah wrote, Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. You got to understand what he's writing, the perspective that he's writing this from. This is after the Babylonians had swept through Jerusalem and it just trashed it and, and, and burned the, the walls down, knocked the walls down. And, and there are people that were battling because of the lack of food and they left behind the weak and the elderly and those that wouldn't be useful in Babylon, they basically left them behind so that they would perish there in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah looks around. He looks around and in a situation where it's all barren and, and gloomy, he says this, this I, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Even in this situation, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Watch this. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. New every morning. You know, I always say this. When I have something that, I, that comes into my life that is an obstacle or it's just unannounced and it, and it comes and it, it turns your world upside down, have you, have you ever noticed this, that when you're really tired, that's no time to deal with it because it seems if it's a if if it, a hump in the road can seem like a monster mountain when you're tired but you get some rest you get some rest and we often credit it okay in the morning i'll get rested up and and it'll look different and and that's true but there's something else i think that we forget and that is verse 23 on a screen that along with the rest, every morning comes the mercies of God. So as a new day dawns, the problem may still be there, but God is faithful to, to give us the grace that we need, the strength that we need, because he is compassionate toward us so that we can get through that day, so that we can deal with that situation in our lives. But I go back to these three obstacles and I say this to you. Chances are several of you sitting here tonight, you have an obstacle. I'll remind you of this, God is greater than that obstacle. If he can change the heart of the king he come up with a way to redo the, de the death decree, and he took away the gloom and despair. He can move anything out of the way in our lives. My responsibility is to trust him while he works. 
Remember this, Romans 8, 28, we've often quoted it, and I do, and I thought of this the other day. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things. But each individual situation may not look good. you got to keep that in perspective. All things. They all work together for good. One situation might be very dire and very discouraging. And that's because that's all we can see. But God sees the whole picture. God sees it all. And someday we will too. Someday we will too. Until then, it is our responsibility to trust him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for the encouragement from this chapter. Lord, we all face obstacles. We all face situations that we would love nothing more than to be able to change the situation. And Lord, we, sometimes we grow desperate. And Lord, we worry so much. And Father, we lack faith because we let worry creep in and fear. And, and Father, tonight we've been brought to this chapter to be reminded, and I know my own self, to be reminded that Lord, there's no heart so stubborn. There's no writing that is so permanent. There's no gloom that is so thick that can't be removed. Writings can be reversed and hearts can be changed. Father, thank you for that encouragement. As we go out of here tonight, Lord, we'd ask you to take us home safely as we Go about our week, the rest of the week. Might we be like Mordecai? Might we walk out and because we are royalty, might others be able to see the hope that is within us and desire that hope? For Lord, there's no hope in this world at all, none. But there's hope in Christ. So Father, we pray all this now and ask you Jews to study for your honor and your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.